We have been looking at the message of the Bible, and we are now in the New Testament. We finished up last week looking at the book of 1 Corinthians. Now we're going to begin and try to finish the New Testament by looking at the beginning in the book of 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, chapter 7, in verse 9 and 10, the Apostle Paul wrote about genuine repentance. He says, Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. In this passage, the Apostle Paul teaches us that there are two different types of sorrow. There is sorrow of a world that produces nothing. Just being sorry you did something, that's not enough. You have to have godly sorrow. Sorrow that is manifest that you know that you sinned against God. And that you violated His covenant. That you violated His law. And genuine repentance, that means from the heart, that means genuine being sorry for my conduct and turning away from it. Repentance means changing a mind that results in changing a conduct. That leads us to salvation. But simply being sorry produces nothing but death. Let me give you an illustration. An alcoholic might quit drinking because he's told by his doctor that if he doesn't quit, he's going to die. Now, he's sorry that he drank, but does he, have, does he have godly sorrow? The only way that we know he'd have godly sorrow if he understands he not only violated uh, his own body, but he also violated the will of God, and he's sorry that he didn't listen to God and he didn't follow God's instruction, and then he ceases to drink, that means that he has had genuine repentance. But if he's just sorry and never picks up another drink and just goes on and continues living his life with no regard for God, that being sorry and repenting of his drinking, that won't save him. That's worldly sorrow. It has to be godly sorrow. In the book of Galatians was written to the churches of Galatia. There were many problems in the first century concerning those who were trying to bind the covenant. In this, chap in this book, the Apostle Paul deals with that. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, But even if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than that which you have preached to you, let it be accursed. As I've said before, so say I now again. If anyone preaches any other gospel other than that which you have received, let it be accursed. There were those who were perverting the gospel of Christ. They were teaching a different message. They were teaching something that was contrary to the will of God. And he said, if you accept that, if you accept a message that's other than the one that we received, that we've written down by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and you preach any other gospel, then you're to be accursed. That was true then, it's true now. That if any man preaches anything other that's contained in this gospel, in this law, it's not to be accepted. Why? Because it's not the gospel, it's a perversion of the gospel, and therefore it will lead you into sin. And so we need to remember that we are bound to follow the gospel. No other message, there's no other message that can say, man, we looked at that last week looking at Romans 1.16. In the book of Ephesians, it was really divided up into two parts. The first three chapters of this sixth chapter book deals with the grandeur and the beauty and the majesty of the church and the, how God had a plan for that before the world began. But then in chapters 4 through 6, it talks about practical lessons, about applications of how we change our lives according to the teaching. In Ephesians chapter 4, we have the seven ones. There is one body. There is one spirit. Just as you are called and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God. And Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. Now, in many of these ones, the worlds agree. They agree that there's only one Holy Spirit. They agree that there's only one Lord who died for our sin. They agree that there's only one God. And most of them even believe that there is one hope that's only found in Christ. But on these other things, they have some different opinions. One body means one body. How many bodies does that mean? That means more than zero and less than two. There is one body. That one body is the church. And yet today, we have four, over 1,500 churches alone in the world. Well, which one is the right church? Which one is the one body of Ephesians 4? It's the one that belongs to Christ and the one that you can find its identifying marks by following the New Testament. What about this one baptism? We have many 
who believe that you can be sprinkled, you can be poured. You don't have to be baptized at all. You just have to have grace. You just have to have faith. Some of you, you just have to pray through. Some of you go on the morning's bench. Well, there's different opinions about that. Yep, that's a violation of what God said. And then this one faith. That means one standard of truth. That means one standard that is the standard for all men. Well, men don't believe that. Many uh, religions of men have their own creed books, have their own books of theology, have their own uh, manuals, and yet that's not part of the one faith. And so, again, we see the Bible is very clear that there is one standard of truth. There is one church that Jesus built, and it leads us to the ones given by the one spirit. And it was paid for by the one Lord. And so if we're going to follow God's will, then we're going to have to ascribe to not some of these ones. We're going to have to ascribe to all of them in order to be pleasing to God. That's a picture of the church of today in the ruins of Ephesus. This is a ruin in Philippi. This was written to the church at Philippi, uh, the Philippian letter. Fulfill my joy, being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Again, Christianity is a religion that is not compatible with selfishness. We must look to the interest of others. We must put others before us. We must look to others. We must esteem them better than ourselves. We must look to their interests. And again, you notice this reoccurring theme of being of one accord and of one mind. How can you be of one accord and one mind? If you're following the same standard of truth. If you're following God's word, then you're going to be of one mind and one standard. And so Christianity is a religion of service. If you're going to be successful in being a Christian, you've got to be a servant. You've got to be willing to serve others. And if you're not willing to serve others, then you can't be a disciple of Christ. Book of Colossians, written to the church at Colossae. If you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. This passage would tell us that we can't continue life as we used to. If we're in Christ, then we've got to seek things above. We've got to be spiritually minded. We have to seek the things of the Lord. We have to seek the things that are on His mind. And we must put our mind on things above. We must keep our focus on heaven. We must keep our focus on spiritual things. And therefore, we're going to have to change our life. And the book of Colossians talks about that in this third chapter. It talks about taking, putting off the old man of sin and putting on the new man of Christ. And again, we leave one life for another life. We're going to live for Christ instead of living for self. And again, this is part of the transformation that must take place. Then you have the first book of Thessalonians written to the church of Thessalonica. And in chapter 5, verse 19 through 22, Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecy. Test all things, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from every form of evil. That's a good instruction, test all things. People today would not be in error, would not be in apostasy, if they tested all things, if they put their faith to the test, if they examined what they were taught, and what they believe, and is it in agreement with what the scripture says. I challenge you today, ladies and gentlemen, to examine your faith, to test the things that you believe. Is what you're being told true? Is what people who you have great confidence in, who may be someone that you've known, or a religion you've been in for many years because it's in your family, but have you ever tested your faith? Have you ever examined the beliefs that you have and the things that you base your faith upon to see if they're contained in the Word of God. We need to do that. And then we need to abstain from every form of evil. Anything that has an appearance of evil needs to be rejected, needs to be stayed away from. And if you remember in Galatians 5, where Paul lists the works of the flesh, the last part of that list had to do with and such like. Anything that has similar characteristics than these works of the flesh you need to leave them alone. You need to abstain from them. Why? Because they lead you into sin. Let me give you an example. There's not a passage in the Bible that says, Thou shalt not death. But the principle is contained 
in the sin of lust, lasciviousness, of having unlawful sexual desire, and that's what dancing generates. And so that's such what? That's something that's an appearance of evil. That's something that we need to abstain from. But, you know, other people say, well, it doesn't say thou shalt not. Yes, it does. It says in principle. You see, God doesn't just teach in thou shalt and thou shalt not. Sometimes he teaches in principle. And if something has an appearance of evil, if you think it's evil, if you have questions about it, you're not sure about it, then don't do it. Because what you do is you're going to lead yourself into sin, and you're going to violate your conscience, and that is a sin according to Romans 14.23. In the second letter of Thessalonians, there's a very important verse I want to share with you. It's in verse 10 through 12. It says, And with all unrighteousness, deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, those who have great difficulty with this passage, because they believe that God is sending them mean by being lost, but that's a misunderstanding of the passage. We know in passages like Second Peter, Chapter 3, that God desires all men to come to repentance, doesn't wish any to perish. But if you don't love the truth, if a man doesn't love the truth, he will believe the strong delusion. He will believe the thing that deceives him. He'll, do, he'll believe it, not because God sent it to, to him to, to be deceived, because God allowed it, because he didn't have a love of the truth. And they'll be condemned, not because... God sent them this strong delusion, but because they believed it, because they didn't love the truth, and they didn't believe the truth. And if you don't love the truth, and you don't believe the truth, then you make yourself vulnerable to believe the strong delusion. And again, God will allow you to believe it, because you don't have the love for the truth. And so the one who's really to blame is yourself, because you must love the truth, and then the strong delusion can't lead you away. Now this is a book that was written to an individual. Paul wrote a uh, letter to his young brother Timothy. And in chapter 6, verse 11 and 12 of this book, Paul would write, But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, to which you also called and confessed a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. We're in a spiritual battle between the flesh and the spirit. Satan wants to gain our soul and take it to hell with him for all eternity. God wants us to be with him in heaven. So we're in this spiritual battle, the flesh against the spirit. And we're, we're having this battle of who's going to gain supremacy. If you're going to get to heaven, you're going to have to fight. You're going to have to grab hold of eternal life, and you're going to have to hold it dearly, and you're going to have to be faithful to it. And you're going to have to resist the temptation that Satan places in front of us in order to lead us into sin and win us away from God. And so you are in a spiritual fight. And anybody that gets to heaven is going to have to fight in order to get there. They're going to have to maintain their spirituality. And they're going to have to love their relationship with God. And they're going to have to be faithful to his teaching in order to lay hold on eternal life. In the second letter... In verse 14 and 15, a very familiar passage of scripture. Remind them of these things, charge them before the Lord, not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of hearing. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. This would be the Apostle Paul's last letter prior to his death. But notice, he tells us to, to study, to be diligent, to study the word. To why? So we can rightly divide it. What does it mean to rightly divide the word? That means to use it correctly. That means to use it in a way that it is not in violation of what it teaches. We need to rightly divide it. There is an old covenant. There is a new covenant. There is an old law. There is a new law. There is a law that applies to us, and there is a law that was nailed to the cross. We need to be able to rightly make those divisions. We need to be rightly in how we handle the word of God. And you cannot do that without study. You cannot be a good, faithful Christian 
without a knowledge of God's Word. And you can't gain that knowledge without study. It takes personal effort and desire. Titus. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteous, and godly in the present age. I want you to notice that it says grace teaches us. Many in the world will tell you that grace saves us without us doing anything. Now according to this verse, it says it teaches us. What does grace teach us to do? It teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. That's something it does. That's something that you do. You must deny ungodliness. You must deny worldly lust. You must resist those things. But you also must live soberly, righteous, and godly. That's something you do. That's action. Grace teaches us that we need to live a certain way. We have to live soberly. We have to live righteously according to God's word. And we have to live godly lives. That's something we do. Grace teaches us that. It teaches us that we must conform our lives to his teachings. Philemon was a runaway slave. And in Philemon, verse 21, having confidence in your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. He encouraged this slave owner to receive back his slave, now not more, not just as a slave, but as a fellow brother, as a Christian, and to treat him in that manner. And again, it's showing that there are physical relationships, even in that time, that may not be very uh, beneficial, may not be something that we would like. There was slavery in the first century, but they, being a Christian, wouldn't release them from slavery. But if you had uh, a Christian that was a slave and you had a slave owner that was a Christian, that they had a relationship and it should be seen by the way that each of them treat one another. The book of Hebrews is a very powerful book. It was written to Hebrew Christians who were considering going back to Judaism in order to escape the persecution of the first century. And it was showing them if they did that, then they gave up all their advantage in Christ. We see that the superiority of Christ. In the first three verses, we have the credentials of Jesus Christ. The reason that he's a spokesperson for God, nobody has the credentials that Jesus has. He's the Son of God. He died for our sin. He purged him. He's now sitting on the throne of David in heaven, ruling and reigning over his kingdom. No other person has those credentials. That's why he can best speak for God. Hebrews 2, 1 through 4, the danger of drifting. The Hebrews are warned that they can drift away if they don't take hold of the teaching of Christ and conform it to their life, and it can drift away. In Hebrews 4 and 9, we're told of the promised rest that remains for the people of God. In Hebrews 5, 12 through 14, they were rebuked because they failed to grow. They did not. The time that they ought to be teachers, they have need for others to come and teach them again the first principles of the oracles of God. And they needed milk and not strong meat. Why? Because they had not exercised their conscience to discern between good and evil. They had not grown and matured spiritually. That's a sin. Second Peter 3 would also teach that same truth. Chapter 9, verse 15 through 17 teaches us that the law of Christ came into being when he died. When you make a will, it has no power while you're alive, but as soon as you die, that will takes forth. Until Jesus died on the cross, his will could not be enacted. But when he died, that enacted his will. In Hebrews chapter 11, we have what sometimes is called the roll call of the faithful. But the important part of Hebrews chapter 11, that it shows what real Bible faith is. If you look in Hebrews 11, you'll see the phrase, by faith. And after that term, by faith, you'll see that they did something. By faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. By faith, Noah built an ark. By faith, Abraham left his homeland. By faith, Sarah had Isaac. By faith, Rahab hid the spies. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell. Over and over and over again, you see, by faith. Faith is acting obedient. Biblical faith is obedient faith. When a man acts according to God's will, that is Bible faith. James. James talks about things that are practical in nature. But no man can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless God, and we, our Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessings and cursing. 
My brethren, these things ought not to be so. We're to use our tongue in a way that brings glory and honor to God, that uplifts his name, that demonstrates who we are and what we believe. And when we use it in an unprofitable way, then we have violated our responsibility to God. First book of Peter, 1 Peter 3, verse 10 through 12. For he who would love life, see good day, let him refrain his tongue from evil, let his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. His ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. <coughs> Excuse me. Prayer is a spiritual blessing, and it's only given to those who are his children. The only way I can address God as my father is by me his family. If you're outside the family of God, you do not have the blessing of prayer. It doesn't mean that God doesn't hear you. He does hear you, but he has no obligation to answer because you're not part of his family. And therefore, we must be in God's family in order to receive the benefit of prayer. Second Peter, we have the Christian graces. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, virtue knowledge, knowledge self-control, self-control perseverance, the perseverance godliness, the godliness brotherly kindness, and the brotherly kindness love. You see what these are? These are things we add to our faith. It's a growth process. You can't just stay status quo. If you're going to be faithful to God, you've got to grow spiritually. You've got to mature. You've got to be able to understand more. You've got to be able to do more. You've got to have a deeper appreciation for God as you grow closer and closer and understand more and more of His Word. That's a duty. That's not an option. If you want to be pleasing to God, you must add these things to your faith. It's not, you, it's not something you pick and choose which one. You've got to add all of these, and it's a process that we go through as we live our life for God. Book of 1 John. Book of 1 John is a book about love. If you want to understand the relationship that we have as brethren, you need to read 1 John. Here's an important verse in the book of 1 John. Do not love the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, Pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. We can't love the world. That means we can't live like the world. We can't talk like the world. We can't act like the world. We can't have the same focus that the world has. We can't love this so much that we forget about our relationship with God. God gave us this world, and we can live in it. He gave man to have dominion over it. But he's not to love it so much that he loves him more than he loves God. If he does, he will lose his soul. Second John, very important verse. Whoever transgression does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ is both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him to your house nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. If you don't abide in the doctrine, the teaching of Christ, then you lose fellowship with the Father and Son, and you're in spiritual jeopardy. You must abide in the teaching of Christ. Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well. We are to love our brethren. Jude, common salvation. We are to contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. The word once here means one time for all time. God delivered one message of truth. There's no latter-day revelation. There's no more additional message. This is the last message that God will ever send men, and it's the one that we must conform our lives to. That leads us to the most controversial book in the New Testament, the book of Revelation, and I'm just going to uh, go over this very briefly. Revelation was a Christ revelation to the Apostle John, written on the Isle of Patmos. In Revelation 1, verse 3, it said, Blessed are those who read this book, keep the things that are contained in it. You have to be able to understand the book of Revelation because how could you keep it if you don't understand it? Revelation 2 and 3 is addressed to the seven churches of Asia. Revelation 1 verse 9 tells us that the kingdom was in existence in the first century because John was part of it. We also read in Revelation 21 verse 1 through 4 the vision of heaven and how wonderful and beautiful heaven will be. And we're given the pro we're given the commandment and the prohibition that we're not to add or take away from anything that's written in the book of Revelation. For if we do, our name will be taken 
out of the book of life. The book of Revelation is a comforting book. Sadly, many have misunderstood, mistaught, twisted, and perverted it by making it a mythical book, by telling us that 95% of the book has yet to come to pass. That's false. 95% of the book's already happened, and they have it completely backward because they dictate the meaning of Revelation by current events. If prophecy is done by current events, then it's not a prophecy of God. Also, this book was written to the seven churches of Asia. If 95% of it has not occurred yet, how does it help, and how did it help, those seven churches who were going under persecution, even death for their faith, would not have helped them. Must have meaning to those seven churches. And so, that's the New Testament message. Our Savior has come, and He's coming back again. How do we prepare for His second coming? We obey the gospel. We repent if we are living in sin. This message can be understood. This message must be understood. It's a choice that we make. The Bible is not complicated. You need to open it. You need to pray about it. Then you need to study it. And then you need to put it into practice in your life. If we want to understand the message, we can understand the message. Understand this message, it can be understood. If you don't understand it, please let us help you. It's not a complicated book. It has a very simple message and a very simple problem. And its problem is a sin. This book is written to give men the answer to the sin problem, the scheme of redemption. That's what this message is all about, how God was going to reconcile sinful men back to him, and that would be done through his son by his sacrifice on the cross. This book will tell you how to enjoy that relationship, how to maintain that relationship, and how to get out of this world alive. This is the only book that can do that. The message of the Bible, a message that's necessary for all the world to hear.